thanks very much for joining us um, to the European Outlook 2021. Um, and, and this is part of a series um, with this particular event focused on the CEE. Really super panel for you. Just in case you don't know us, my name's Richard Betts. Um, I'm the group publisher at Real Asset Media. Um, just in terms of, of what we do, um, we publish a number of magazines. We're also active with the International Investors Lounge at Expo Real. Um, and, and also we've launched a number of new initiatives over 2020, including Realcast, which is a sort of roundup of the week, um, a special report series, the first of which was an impact on uh, coronavirus. And there'll be five special reports coming in 2021. And of course, moving all of these sessions online, as well as part of Real Asset Live, um, introducing RealX, which is a, a virtual platform and uh, an, an exhibition. I mean, I know a number of people are watching um, this event from within RealX, um, and, and you're joining over 10,000 visitors who've been there since September 2020. Um, so thanks very much for joining us wherever you are, um, whether that's in RealX or, or directly in the in the Zoom webinar. Let's let's just start briefly with you, Marek. Just just a very quick introduction on, um, I suppose, yourself um, and uh, and. And, and also the company. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Richard. If you can hear me all, uh, delighted to be here once again, uh, supporting this event. My name is Marek Mathrashek. I'm the chairman of CC Government Relations, which is a major political communications consultancy throughout Central Europe. I, I'm the chairman of the regional organization and also obviously supervising the Warsaw office and happy to be here to uh, kick off this very interesting day for you uh, with a very broad overview of where Central Europe as a region uh, is going to move over the next few years in the context of what's been going on in the United States and the European Union and how Central Europe fits into that shifting landscape and also obviously looking at some of the macroeconomic uh, 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 outlooks that we have uh, for the region. Sure, uh, but just Thomas, just a, just a quick one minute on on yourself and the company. I'm basically senior director of the Invesco in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, particularly, I'm I'm basically in charge of the transactions. Uh, so we oversee the region. Um, Invesco as a company, um, obviously, um, it's one of the largest global investment uh, management company. Um, uh, just in terms of the in 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 the Europe, um, we manage uh, approximately 15 billion euros. Um, in CE, we have roughly uh, 15 to 20 percent in fluctuates, but but basically 15 to 20 percent of the overall portfolio is 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 actually invested uh, in my region. Uh, so that's that's a brief uh, summary of uh, what I do. Super. Thanks very much, Luke. Great. Good morning. Uh, my name is Luke Dawson. I'm the Regional Managing Director and Head of Capital Markets for Colliers across Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and for those that don't know, Colliers is uh, one of the leading real estate agencies globally uh, with offices across Central and Eastern and the rest of Europe and most of the key markets across the globe. Super. Thanks very much. Justina. My name is Justina uh, Kędzierska and I'm heading, I'm representing the uh, the uh, well, Warsaw office of Berlin Hub. Berlin Hub is one of the leading real estate lenders in Germany. We are specialist just, uh, specialized just uh, on real estate, and we've been present in CE and in particular here in Poland, also with some uh, interest in the Czech market uh, since 2006. So uh, it's been quite a while. Super, thanks very much. Thanks, Kevin. Good morning. Um, so Kevin Turpin, I'm based in the Czech Republic, but I've been uh, living and working in the CE region uh, in the area of property market research uh, for uh, over 15 years. And I've uh, been at Colliers now since uh, the end of 2019. And Perfect. Thanks very much. And look forward to the presentation in a second. And last but very much not least, John. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name's John Harcourt. I'm the Managing Director for Kojima Properties, which is the uh, real estate investment and uh, development arm of uh, the Kojima Corporation of, of Japan. Uh, and we, we, we focus on, on most uh, real estate and sort of public sector um, areas across uh, mainland, much of mainland Europe and also in the UK. And uh, we've got a um, quite a large uh, presence in Poland, particularly in logistics um, and uh, in student housing and an ascent residential sector 
Super, thanks very much. So really interesting and varied varied panel there. Lots of lots of good information to come. So um, John, Luke and Justina and, and Thomas, um, if you could come back in, that would be great. Um, and then we'll we'll just just pick up, I think, on um, I think some of the kind of key aspects that, that we're looking at. Um, I mean, maybe maybe Luke, just just starting with you. Um, I suppose when you're looking at, at 2020, um, you know, we've heard there from from Marek and, and, and Kevin, but I suppose how do you see um, the the last year? <laughs> it felt like about five years, but um, <laughs> I, I think it was interesting in the sense that uh, things at the beginning of last year, if you if you rewind exactly about a year ago, it felt incredibly positive, I would say, across Europe, but in particular, Central Europe. Uh, we had several kind of larger deals. There was great investment volume coming through. We had a good pipeline of things for sale. Um, and then the music stopped. And, and I think we went through this phase in the summer where there was, there was that initial panic and things started to calm down. But we really didn't have visibility in terms of uh, where it was going to go. And then I think as we as we got through to really beginning of the fourth quarter, end of the third quarter, the, the positivity started to come, particularly with the vaccine news. And I, I believe that uh, the, the capital that was allocated to be spent last year largely hasn't gone away. It's just been sitting on the sidelines and waiting. And then when we started to see that there was a positive momentum with, okay, we've got hope, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, we, we started to see now more things being brought to market, um, even just from our perspective, the amount of, of, of pitches that are either happened or will be happening has increased dramatically if you rewind back to say Q3 where there really wasn't a lot going on. And now I think it's a bit of a question of timing of, look, we want to launch something and can we launch it in light of travel being uncertain for the next little while? Um, but the general view is as we get towards the second half of the year, uh, it's going to be very, very positive. I mean, if you look, we, we just released the survey of, of global sentiment, and the view was that investors are feeling there's going to be about a 50% increase in global investment volumes, um, meaning that we're going to see a, a spike, frankly, probably as we get to the second half of this year in terms of what they're looking for. Now, specifically what they're looking for is going to change. That, that's concrete. We're going to see people much more of flight to quality. We're going to see larger platform deals. We're going to see alternatives become a much bigger part of, of, of what people are looking at. Um, and I think portfolios are going to be a bigger play as well as people look to kind of diversify risk. So uh, frankly, while we're still going to have the a massive tail end of, of COVID for the first half of this year, and it's going to be different, and we're going to have challenges in terms of getting deals done, uh, I think that the sentiment has shifted dramatically in the past four or five months. Um, that's that's interesting. Um, and Thomas, from, from your point of view, let's pick up that point around, um, I suppose, also uh, your insights on, on 2020 going into 2021. And are you seeing a much more kind of positive um, outlook um, because of the vaccine and those kinds of things coming through? I, I, I would confirm that. I think that the sentiment is getting definitely more positive. Um, I think that there, there, there are a couple of really visible trends. The, the first one being is that um, I would echo what Luke said. There is a massive equity wave into the real estate. I think over the globe, I would tend to say that the, uh, the exposure to the real estate direct allocation of the global players will increase. Um, uh, we, we can actually see that, that generally among the major pension funds, there used to be a kind of thumb of rule that uh, the real estate allocation contributed to eight to 12%. I think that now it's getting much closer to 15 and, and to a certain extent, even 20%. They don't have a problem to increase that allocation. Um, secondly, I think that the investors after the initial shock, um, they started to operate within the level of the uncertainty and they're trying to find segments where they just feel uh, like a safe heaven. Uh, they're looking uh, to buy into the segments and sectors which they perceive as a, as a lower risk, uh, which are proving to be more resilient against those major disruption. 
and uh, these are absolutely winners. So I would I would say that the top two uh, segments are definitely logistics, um, logistics and the PRS, um, which will and we're gonna see much more capital going into those segments, and 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 obviously it's it's also majorly driven by the occupier side and there are really quite a number of really interesting trends in the logistic channel and how basically you know big players perceive um uh, a resilient in the um basically residential sector we're gonna see massive wave and the yields will compress in those absolutely two segments offices are a really interesting segment because I think that more and more, um, I, I, I would tend to say that there will be a major fly to the quality as well. And those super core assets will always uh, trade well. At the same time, I, I feel that there is a much more uncertainty when it comes to drilling down to the covenant. What, what actually, as a, as a fundamental investor, what am I buying, really? Uh, is the contract that I'm buying uh, will transmire, transmit into really the cash income that I would expect to receive. There will be more analysis on the credit worthiness of the of the tenants in what actually territory they operate, and as a result of this, we might actually see for the mid, from the short to mid term, um, maybe some mismatch of the perception of what should be the seller's uh, responsibility toward the buyers. Um, and um, and that will obviously influence um, uh, the operational and investments in that in that asset class. Um, but I actually I I would echo that um, uh, vaccination has definitely uh, positively influenced the investment spectrum, and the sentiment is getting much better. and And I think that uh, I would I would tend to say. That if there would not not be any further major uh, waves coming, which is questionable, and I'm not really the expert in that field, so I don't want to even comment on it, we will definitely see a, a big spike of the investment activity, and um, and uh, especially this will be driven in those two segments which I've I've named. John, just just picking up that some of those points around capital, especially, um, but also the types of sector, and we'll drill down a little bit more into the into the sectors as we move through this. Um, but what's what's your sense of that? I mean, Thomas mentioned the PRS coming more in. Um, how do you see, I suppose, those trends coming into twenty twenty one? I mean, I think I, I would um, echo a lot of what's already been said by by Thomas and and by and by Luke. You know, P, I mean, taking PRS for example, it's the largest sector in the in the US in terms of institutional investment, and and there's no doubt that that will continue to grow in in Europe. I think there's a there's a catch up in terms of expertise um, and uh, and sort of how it looks as a product, but but uh, the direction of travel and certainly the quality and quantity of of equity that will come in will will, will continue to grow, um, and I mean, you know, and, and and logistics. I think the last twelve months have taught us a number of things, and I think you know one has to look at simple things like you know the the Allegro IPO, you know the demand from investors for 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 real estate in the sector, and and you know people shopping from home means that sector is not going to go away. I mean, you know, the, the, it's not as if it's without its. You know, the cautions on the on the distant horizon. Things like you know, European antitrust activity for for big tech companies may have some sort of impact. But I mean, that's I think that's down the road. I mean, in the meantime, and I I I do sense that um, things like offices uh, and and retail have perhaps been over slightly over oversold in terms of the negative impact of of the pandemic. I mean, you know, I think it was Brookfield. You know, with their with their share buyback, they've announced are are doing so because they see both those sectors as being grossly undervalued now, um, particularly retail, where there is undoubtedly going to be opportunities in terms of repositioning um, and uh, refocusing of of you know a sector which you know as human beings we all fundamentally would like to interact with each other people with with other people, uh, and the same goes for offices. Um, the difference with offices is that you know I think across across the across Europe across the world. It's going to be sort of quality rather than quantity, uh, and um, and so you know, 
that that itself creates opportunities for repositioning other assets. But um, yeah, I, I, th I think all sectors are going to be be of interest. It just depends on what your what your risk appetite is and where you come in. Um, Okay, good. Um, and Justina, obviously you're coming at looking at this from a from a different perspective in a way, from the financing perspective. Um, do you see that becoming more challenging in in twenty twenty one in terms of your ability to be able to work out where and and how you should lend? Of course, in the in the first weeks following the pandemic outbra outbreak, uh, there was lots of nervousness, uncertainty. There still is uh, among the among the banks. Um, exactly as it was among the investors. So I think in what has been said so far by the, uh, Thomas, by Luke now, um, it looks like we are, well, still on the same side, uh, let's say, of the, uh, of the force. I mean, we have exactly the same uh, approach. We are exactly paying attention right now to the, to the same elements of the, of the, well, real estate projects, which are, which are there in the market as the investors do. Uh, and well, after this stressful, let's say, first weeks um, uh, of the pand after the pandemic outbreak, which is like which was like a kind of a shock result, uh, I think the banks uh, also started to look at the very fundamentals of the real estate. Of course, uh, looking carefully what's what's going on in the market, and in fact, um, after the first lockdown. Uh, I think that the um, that the activity uh, was again well quite high. I mean, in terms of the lenders, so it's like you know, okay, we saw where we are. We have our well approach, our strategy. We know what kind of product we would like to finance, and let's do it. Yes. Yeah? So I don't think that uh, the banks were less active um, than before. Uh, of course, the selection of product will be will be a bit uh, more different. Maybe you will see also um, a bit more conservative approach in certain in certain elements, like more equity. But for example, not necessarily in terms of logistic because logistics because logistics uh, again, as for majority of the investors, uh, I feel was number one for many of the lenders. But on the other hand, I don't think that the office segment suffered a lot uh, in fact uh, because as um, thomas also said the right product uh, will always uh, find uh, interest i mean the right product will always be there so um, it's again uh, back to looking at the fundamentals of the uh, of the um, of the opportunities of the real estate uh, product and uh, well and of course the the further availability uh, of the loans will very much of the financing will very much depend on the um, well on the economy. I mean, um, should the economy uh, indeed recover as quickly as we all hope it will? Uh, for example, for Poland, it is forecast that I believe that the uh, GDP level, uh, pre-pandemic GDP level, will be uh, will be achieved again in Q3 this year which is i think a great result uh, and of course uh, well so depending on this on this development of the economy uh, well um, the banks will also well let's say uh, manage their their internal policies luca i just wanted to pick up with you um in terms of capital Obviously, over the last few years, we've seen increasing amounts of Asian capital coming into the market um, and, and in general, an increasing range and depth of capital looking at CE markets. Um, did that change in, in 2020? What are, you, are you already seeing signs in 2021 of, of what, what to expect? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it definitely changed in 2020. Um, with, with the initial reason just being, frankly, travel, that I think a lot of the Asian investors, if they didn't have a, a local partner that had kind of boots on the ground that could look at assets and run the due diligence, et cetera, they were really frozen out. Um, and that's still going to be somewhat the case, I think, I think for, frankly, at least the first half of the year, if not longer. Um, what we did see is that the Korean capital that had obviously been so dominant the years before, um, that had fallen off even frankly before COVID. Um, so there was still some interest from, from Korean money, but it wasn't nearly at the same volumes and, and frankly as aggressive as it had been. And I suspect we will still see Korean capital, but really they've shifted their focus much more towards prime 
locations, prime offices in kind of core cities of Paris and London, et cetera. Um, and I don't think they're going to be kind of pushing pricing the way that they were. Having said that, what we have seen is that you've seen new money coming in from the likes of, of Malaysia, of Singapore, of Japan. Um, obviously, with John on the call can, can vouch for that. And I think that that trend is going to continue across Europe, uh, including Central and Eastern Europe. And, and they've now, the majority of them have either set up shop in residence in Europe, where they have offices, whether it's in London or Paris, et cetera, or they have partners that can actually execute. So it's our feeling Asian capital is gonna increase uh, in terms of activity this year. It's just gonna be much more diversified in terms of where it's coming from uh, than it has in the past. Um, just going back to your the, the question on uh, asset classes and where this is going to go, just an interesting data point that I, I should have mentioned previously. When we when we spoke with the MEA investors of what are you looking for in 2021, there's been a quantum shift in, uh, I think, their preference. So office is still number one. So 31% of investors said we're going to focus primarily on offices. Having said that, though, if you look at it, the second most likely is logistics with data centers being fourth. So if you combine logistics and data centers together, it's actually the primary focus of investors or the most preferred asset class in total. Um, and actually multifamily residential built to rent was 17%. So you've got this shift of data centers and multifamily now being the third and fourth most attractive investment classes with hotels and retail being miles behind in, in single digit preference. Um, so I think just to give some, some data around it, there's clearly been a massive shift. Whereas if you had looked at this two years ago, it would have simply been offices, probably logistics with retail, either neck and neck with that. And then all the other alternatives would have been much further down the chart. So I think it was just interesting to see that quantified in data uh, rather than just the talk that we normally hear. Yeah, no, that is interesting because there's there's been a lot of focus on. Um, I mean, I, I've been seeing a lot in news and interviews that I've been doing um, really over the past six to nine months, I suppose, around data centers, and also the similarity in some ways between data centers and logistics um, to to a certain extent. John, I, I wanted to pick up with you the the point that Luke made there. A also about the alternatives, but also particularly about um, kind of your perception of of the capital both looking at, at Europe, but also specifically at the, the CE. On the alternatives, I mean, obviously, we, we've invested quite heavily into the student housing sector in, in Poland with Student Depot. Um, and what I think that is that is highlighted, and this comes back from our experience in the United States, where we've de delivered, I think, nearly 10,000 um, PRS units, is that the, the strength of the operational platform is, is key to success in that business. So Student Depot has managed to maintain a 90% occupancy despite the pandemic. Um, and that's not been easy, but it has happened. And for us, that is down to 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 having a very close idea, you know, focus on the costs of the business, the operating uh, practicalities and, and you know, a focus on the bottom line. Um, and so I fully expect to see further growth in, in sectors such as PRS. However, what it then also needs is a sort of growth in the operating sort of strengths. So, and that's across Europe, I think, um, not, not just in CE, but I think it's an exciting time. And I think the capital will, that's coming into the sector and seeking opportunities in the sector will naturally uh, sort of, it'll find its own level and, and, and its own competence uh, as, as it grows and as the weight, weight of money increases. Um, I mean, in terms of capital, uh, I mean, I agree, broadly with what Luke's Luke said you know we we've seen and we've partnered with some Asian um, investment in, in in Europe this year in Poland this year with a with a, a, a purchase of one of the um, one of uh, logistics asset in in Wuj. Um and we're about to close our, our second deal with a, a, another Asian partner we also have um, sort of I would say um, <laughs> How best way to describe it. I mean, we're, we're, we're looking to bring forward some capital, some more Japanese capital into, into Europe and into logistics this year. Um, and and I, I do see things like the Korean market uh, still playing a, quite a big role in Europe uh, this year. And I, But I don't think it will just be focused on offices in, in, in European capitals or, or, or Western Europe. I think, though, that quality of covenant will sort of come to the fore. The lack of travel has has I think put in a, a, a big blip in the in the graph of of capital flows and it will be interesting to see how that, that plays out as 
as international travel does open up. Um, so I think it's slightly too early to call whether that's that's that will come to CE or not, or, or, or will return to the CE or not. But I do think sort of high quality investments, long leases, good covenants, as as ever, will will maintain um, will, will, will will retain strong attraction. Okay, good. Um, and Thomas, there's, uh, there's been a lot of discussion as well in, in previous years. We've been looking at the growth um, of, I suppose, either domestic capital or interregional capital. Um, are you seeing that? And obviously, when we looked at the stats for, for a number of the countries, no doubt also, as, as Luke and John mentioned, because of because of difficulty with traveling, that domestic investors were coming to the fore over, over 2020. What's your sense of that, Thomas, moving forward? Have you been seeing that getting more competitive? Are there markets where it's more difficult than others for somebody like Invesco or an international investor to, to compete with domestic investors? Absolutely. It's always the case. Um, if you, when you have any, any major shock to the economy and the whole market, it is always the case that the global investors will come back and return to their homes in a way uh, where, and, and their own markets, which they do understand the most. And, uh, and uh, they can read in between the lines. They can, they can, they can see some trends and, and it's, it's always perceived by the token as, as a lower risk than investing somewhere outside. This is a general trend. And that has started. I think that there are quite interesting trends. Look, when we when you look at the Germany, the German market from the real estate perspective, it seems like there has not been any major change during 2020 on both the activity sentiment. I mean, the pricing is pretty much untouched. So it, it's you know, and and it's mainly driven by the fact that a lot of global German pension funds have really returned home, and they started to be much more. Uh, much more active in Germany as opposed to investing outside. Generally, uh, when when we look closer to the CEE uh, or CE, and 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 I would cover the, the the top three markets, which is Czech, Polish, and 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 Hungarian market. Uh, there is a clear visible trend. Uh, the basically domestic, uh, I would say that it started to be equity but but now it, it transformed into really kind of private REITs or or um, uh, institutional investors investment management um, in both Czech and Hungarian have dominated and they're they're starting to drive pricing in certain segments uh, which are perceived as 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 an investable asset class which for example traditionally, uh, you know, Invesco would not look at, I don't know, hypermarkets uh, portfolio because they don't really, we, we don't see this as an institutional product. Whilst actually the, the domestic Czech players started to invest in that field. And I remember maybe two years ago, the yields in that segment in the Czech Republic was around 8%. Nowadays, it's like six and a half. You can't find the product. And there's more and more, uh, like 90% of that capital is being domestic. Who are trying to basically invest in that asset class, uh, mainly in the, in the food and the grocery business, which is perceived as a uh, anticyclical. And and this this trend would not be possible without uh, basically those domestic players. Um, Hungarian they also have traditional pretty solid uh, base and plat platform of typically. Um, uh, investment uh, um, companies, which are somehow attached to the banks or pension funds, and they're driving really the, the, the market. Uh, in Poland, it's completely different. Most of the uh, deals in, in Poland are still being uh, driven by the uh, foreign capital. Uh, and I don't think that they have formed a strong uh, domestic uh, platform of the domestic players that would actually uh, make up uh, the, the the market. So, um, but I, I I definitely see that in some segments the domestic players start to be much more active, and uh, particularly when we when we look at, for example, Czech market, it's actually uh, you know maybe five years ago it was like uh, it was marginal market share of the domestic players, 
and I'm sure that uh, maybe Luke can confirm that when we when you look today and we're selling quite uh, quite a lot uh, from day to time uh, in the Czech Republic. Basically, you're definitely you have a more than 50% chance that you'll end up uh, selling it to the Czech basically uh, Czech wealthy, you know, uh, either equity or investment company, uh, and that's that that have, have have definitely changed the 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 dynamics and and the spectrum of the investment base in the Czech both in the Czech as well as uh Hungarian market. Justina, I just wanted to pick up with you on one of the things that I've been particularly hearing as well in you know there's a lot of talk about distressed you know distress coming into the market maybe towards the back end of of 2021. Um What's the situation there in in Poland? Because obviously the landlords couldn't charge rent, um, um, but at the same time, obviously mm-hmm. there's financing in place. But there's also probably similar financing for the retail companies and other companies. Mm-hmm. Um, how difficult do you expect that to be? And do you think there'll be a knock on in terms of the real estate debt side and and um, and maybe some distress in the market? First of all, the banks will were also supported by the banking supervision, let's say, in general authorities. So first of all, there were certain moratoriums. The moratoriums allowed the banks uh, to suspend, to prolong certain um, uh, debt, debt service or, or, or payments under the loan without a necessity to reclassify the loans. And of course, um, while it was a necessary mean, sure, so everyone uh, understood the situation that of course you cannot pay the loan when you do not have any income. On the other hand, we also saw that once the lockdowns um, uh, were over, the, uh, the 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 business activity in retail and so on, uh, it it was there again, and you know with the current um, interest rate uh, rates, you have lots of buffers uh, to be able to earn for your loan payments. Um, the I think the biggest uncertainty element among the um, the, the the landlords um, um, was that no one knew when the next lockdown uh, lockdown will come and how long it will it will take. So they were trying to build certain cash reserves, liquidity reserves, just to be able to survive uh, the difficult times again should they come again. Uh, and uh, well. If you if you if you talk to the bankers in general, I think that uh, the um, the we do not expect that um, a big wave of uh, insolvencies uh, will come for real estate financing. I think that uh, it is more expected um, in terms of corporate lending, uh, because of course um, so far lots of companies uh, have been still. Um, surviving thanks to the financial uh, support, governmental financial support, maybe not all of them, but lots of them definitely. Uh, and now, of course, the question is um, how long this will this will last? How how long they can survive with just this additional, let's say, financial, governmental, financial uh, support? Uh, so, well, uh, we all expect that the uh, that that the next months will show, in fact, who was able to uh, who will be able to survive, who will be there, and of course, the banks expect that there might be a kind of a I don't want to say a wave of uh, insolvency or so it's not about this but the banks uh, are preparing themselves for certain uh, issues that will need to be solved in in next months okay good um and luke um, feel free to pick up john's point obviously um from from earlier what justine is talking about there um with an expectation or, or potentially insolvencies coming through um does that also have implications for uh, i guess when when you're looking at, at, at occupiers and and the kind of rates of occupation that that may be coming into the markets right now you know I mean, we, we, we've seen a lot of demand for people saying, look, is there anything distressed in the market? And the short answer has been no. Um, we haven't seen kind of mass exodus of, of tenants. Uh, and I think, I think you're going to see some restructuring. I definitely think that there's certain, there's certain leases that will shrink over time as they come up on renewal, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I, I don't think that we're going to see any kind of massive change in terms of of companies going insolvent and vacating five, 6,000 square meters of space. 
Um, if anything, what we actually have picked up is we've seen some of the larger tech companies looking to expand uh, in Central Europe and also on the BPO shared service side. Um, they did nothing pretty much last year. And then it seems that they've woken up and we're seeing a few new expansions of five, 6,000 square meters. Um, and, and the driver for that has been much more around the fact that uh, they, I think the idea of, of kind of near shoring is gonna gain in momentum. So any loss we see in terms of companies that are gonna go bankrupt, I think will frankly, hopefully get made up on the other side of companies looking to expand in Central Europe. Um, so there'll, there'll, there'll be some issues, there'll be some companies that will, will have a tough time getting through. But the other thing is that financing right now, uh, in terms of whether you're going for bank financing or MES financing or a JV partner, if you've got a solid business, even if you're short on cash, you should really probably be able to find somebody that's going to step in and help you out. Uh, and I think the companies that won't be able to do that probably had structural issues to begin with. Uh, now, touching on, on what is going to happen, say, in Central Europe for domestic capital check in particular, I mean, I don't have the final figures, but I, I would guess you're looking at 40% plus for last year. That could continue this year. Uh, and, and what's the big change is that the Czech investors traditionally were investing probably more uh, core plus value add, smaller ticket sizes. And now they're stepping into deals that were traditionally kind of reserved for your German investors. So you look at the Churchill deal uh, where Penta sold their office building and you've got Chimana coming in obviously on a JV basis, but it's still, it's 150 million euro ticket. Um, and I think that's kind of going to be much more the trend where as they have gained experience and their portfolios have grown, they're going to be able to compete on the bigger ticket items that they weren't competing with two, three years ago. Uh, so I think it's a great story. And, and I think it's something that's going to happen. Uh, the only downside is, is whether or not they're trading, uh, because so far they've been holding. And, and there's that risk that the market could stall out as things kind of just get aggregated and, and aren't put back on the market for sale. I wanted to pick up with um, with you, John, on, on some of the sectors. Um, alternatives gaining strength. I mean, I, we had a session yesterday focused really on life sciences, for example. Um, so certainly from, from our perspective, we're seeing much more of an interest in, um, you know, student housing, which we've already mentioned, but also senior care, health care, micro living, those kinds of things. Um, what are you seeing in terms of the appetite, I suppose, in in Western Europe and then also moving into CE? Oh, big, uh, big, big, big question. I mean, I think um, I mean, picking up some of those some of those um, some of those sectors, I mean, something like senior living at the moment is, is I think, challenging for, for investors to get their head around, given um, that that demographic has had the highest impact of of the the, the pandemic over the last twelve months, um, but um, un, undoubtedly it forms part of that whole residential package. So that that will be an interesting one to see how it develops. Um, I think I think the the again looking at the US, the US model is it's always a good place to start. The US um, and and the US model of sort of sort of senior villages, which which is probably more experiential place for for people of a certain age to. To sort of while out their days um, enjoying each other's company rather than um, sort of the nursing home sort of um, idea one might have in one's mind. Um, I, I think over the next next uh, several years there's going to be some interesting uh, moves into things like energy. I think energy is a, a really fascinating um, uh, a sector that we are we are actively looking at. Um, I mean, particularly something like Poland, where where one of the I think I think it is the highest um, coal using nation in Europe and, and the obligations of, of the various international treaties and European obligations um, is, is that there will be some growth in, in, in what is and what can be quite a stable um, long income sector. Um, but, but I mean, it, alternatives, I mean, you know, had, what, what was alternative is now mainstream and what was mainstream is perhaps alternative. Something like retail, you know, everyone talks about it's the, the negative impact of the last year and, 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 and longer, thanks to the impact of e-commerce. Um, but I think what, what is lost on the swings might be gained on the roundabouts. A lot of retail um, uh, uh, real estate is, is well positioned to become sort of a last mile distribution hub. And as soon as, as, as someone, someone sort of bright and clever comes up with some great experiential uh, ideas, um, I think that, that, that 
that there's a there's a great repositioning uh, in, in that sector. I mean, you know, ho hotels. I mean, it's a tough, tough, uh, a tough sector. I mean, Kojima as a business is heavily invested in 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 uh, in leisure um, in in Asia in particular, and that's just been, you know, as you can imagine, it's, it's been horrendous. But again, people will come back. People will want to travel more. Uh, quite whether the the, the business travel recovers to where it was is it remains to be seen um, but um you know th those sort of sectors i think will 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 rely on the strength of their operating model and their operating business um you know it, it yeah the, 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 the alternatives is, is a big word but i think everybody is now looking at the bottom line looking at the income stream the quality of the income stream and how resilient it's been and the past 12 months have been a, a great opportunity for investors to investigate you know what actually works what is resilient i mean student housing has always been regarded as sort of counter cyclical you know, a, a defensive sector now um uh, in a market such as the uk where it is a very very mature sector uh, and there's something like uh, 50 times the number of units in the UK compared to Poland. Um, uh, the the sector has sort of faced some some challenges, um, but in a market such as Poland, where there is there is a very it's a very small growing area um, uh, sector, we've we've managed to sustain some really really good occupancy levels. So um, the last 12 months has sorted the wheat from the from the chaff. To use another another sort of cliche. Good. Um, <clears throat> I've just got a question coming in from, from Nicole Dines. Thanks very much for that, Nicole. Strong domestic investors in Czech and Hungary, um, but what about Poland um, that doesn't have them? Has this had a negative impact? Um, or I guess, will we see this having a, a negative impact? Does anybody want to, to pick that up? Does anybody have a, have a view on that about the lack of domestic investors um, in the Polish market compared to the other markets? Well, I, I, can, I can pick that up. Um... I mean, in th this has been legacy from the past that actually Polish market has always developed in a way that it traditionally became a, a foreign, foreign driven. Um, uh, particularly in Poland, the, the logistics market started to play a significant role when it comes to volumes. When you look at 2020 investment volumes, um, this was... I think the record year when it comes to the um, volumes traded in logistics sector, and uh, this will continue through 2021. And I would say at least um, uh, next two, three years will be the key driver of the Polish um, uh, institutional market. Um, also the office sector is traditionally a key bone of the Polish um, investment volumes and still there is a sufficient number of good quality core prime assets that uh, are being on a regular basis being brought to a market. Uh, so so basically, you know, the pipeline in Polish market is much, much stronger relative to the Czech, for example. Um, and those numbers sometimes can be really misinterpreted very easily. It seems like the Czech market became less liquid. It seems, and and we would love to be much more active when it comes to the uh, core market in the Czech Republic. But you know, there is a there is I don't know two three deals per year. That's it. Uh, there is a very limited number of the transaction, but that's not that's mostly driven by the lack of product. It's not really driven by the lack of demand. Uh, Whilst in, in, in Poland, you actually have a sufficient number of the pipeline. And that's why um, uh, basically, you know, despite the fact that you don't have such a major pool of domestic players that would actually make the market more liquid, you still have sufficient number of the foreign capital that is trying to invest in, into the Polish market. And, and, uh, and you know, I, I'm particularly big fan of Polish logistics because there is a there is a really uh, a, a great margin that you're getting and I would I would I don't want to be too quick in assessment but you know we are gonna see a major shift in the yields um, uh, and hardening in the in the in the Polish in uh, you know uh, yields uh, in in logistics
So again, if you've got questions, please do put them in. I'm going to pick up this one now from um, David Allen. Happy New Year, David. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, Romania by population is one of the largest countries in the region. Um, what are the views? Does anybody want to, to pick up on Romania particularly? And then we can also look at some of the other um, uh, cities and regions. Romania had actually a fairly standout year last year. Look at the uh, investment volumes and the activity in spite of it being COVID and everything else. And we were fortunate enough to work on uh, what was the largest transaction in Romanian history with, with Project Giant, which was a transaction between Nepi Rock Castle and AFI. And, and I think what it showed and what was interesting is, is that we had a very diverse range of investors looking at that. Um, and it surprised even us in terms of the geographies that we're willing to look at Romania. We're currently marketing another large portfolio there. And, and it's the same thing. I think what what the interesting thing is, is that people understand the size of Romania once they get to uh, get a little bit in depth in the market. They understand the potential of it. And the other opportunity is really Romanian yields didn't come in nearly as much as they did in the other countries. So if you look at the spread of Romania versus Hungary or Slovakia or Czech, uh, it's significant still. And, and I think, well, it's not necessarily only investing for a value play. You could argue that the fundamentals of the country are strong. GDP is showing still continued growth. Uh, there, there's good spending. There's a lot of positivity there. Um, but you're getting a fair amount of value in that market versus what you're paying in, in the neighboring countries. Um, so I think overall, it's a, it's a positive story. The logistics market there is definitely increasing significantly. And you're seeing a lot of the major regional players now having a disproportionate focus on Romania. Um, and I think the occupier side of Romania is still a strong story because you now have several hubs largely tied to the BPO SSC side, um, but it's not just Bucharest. You have alternative cities that you can look at. It's almost becoming a mini Poland in some respects. So we're positive on it. We think that you're gonna see some significant transactions this year. Um, and I think that you'll see yield compression coming in. Okay, great, thanks. Um, uh, this one's also come in particularly focused on PRS. Um, are the macroeconomic dynamics supporting further growth in this sector, particularly in, in Poland? John, maybe? Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, I could happily pick that one up. I mean, I think that, I mean, Marek made a point right at the start that, that Poland had the, the, the lowest drop in, in, in lowest GDP fall during the course of the pandemic. That's a pandemic, and that's the second time that happened because I think uh, it, it was the same, or at least it didn't drop in the in, in the, um, the the GFC. So, I mean, what, what that says to me is that there is a, a, a an inherent domestic demand uh, within Poland, just generally. Um, and I think that's that's reflective of an upward, sort of upwardly mobile uh, population, aspirational um, and and, sort of you know, benefiting from from the position it's sort of a very central position within europe as a as a as a as both a, 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 a i say distribution hub i don't mean that in a logistic sense but just as a general uh, in a general sense um the the other reason i would i would sort of point to confidence in terms of um in terms of uh, the macroeconomics is is you know, our experience in the student housing sector this year is that we were shut off from the international market and student housing has traditionally been um uh, an international as well as a domestic uh, sector in terms of who, who actually sort of sleeps in the beds. Um, yeah, we've filled those you know two and a half thousand uh, over two and a half thousand beds with with Polish uh, domestic predominantly domestic students with with some some Ukrainian um, and inter as international students. So yeah, there is an upwardly mobile population that want to to live an experiential uh, life, that want to have quality living, that want to. Everyone wants to do better than their parents. And that's, I mean, as my kids repeatedly tell me, um, and, and so I, I feel that the macroeconomics are, are perfectly right for it in, in Poland. Um, if, if any, in many ways, um, more so than than, than other countries where um, perhaps the margins are, are tighter uh, and and the markets are more mature, uh, and therefore. Um, you know, the the, the um, barriers to entry are higher, and the demand from tenants is more competitive. You see, one one of the topics that's that's come up a lot, obviously driven by um, the health crisis, is that focus, which is on wellness, on health, on um, uh, the way buildings are potentially going to have to operate in the future. Um, do you see that as as something that that from a from a finance perspective, you're going to be 
looking at, I mean, I know it was already an area for, for the bank anyway, but is that something that's going to grow for you, particularly, um, you know, because of the health crisis um, and because I guess the trajectory towards um, lower carbon and those kinds of things more generally? Well, in general, uh, I think we all have seen that the pandemic has um, accelerated certain trends. And well, starting from the, um, let's say, the general uh, well, um, well, model of retail, let's say, that will, that will be treated as sustainable one and, and so on. Right now we have huge discussions as uh, regarding the office space in which direction the, the, the future model of the office, uh, office, office space and office users uh, will go. And this is exactly the story also with the general trend to look for the sustainable real estate, sustainable meaning, first of all, energy effective to like an answer to the uh, to the current um, let's say challenges uh, in the world and of course for, for uh, berlin hip we've been um, one of the leaders in the uh, green green bonds uh, market uh, this um, this topic will always be uh, at the top of our agenda we are actively supporting all the green initiatives we are setting also for us very ambitious green uh, targets and we want to continue in this respect. We are also incentivizing um, lending to green assets, let's say, so, so assets uh, that have been green certified and so on. Uh, in addition, we are uh, just now introducing uh, a new product which will be a transformation loan and with this loan, of course, the target is to uh, support um, not so modern um, projects to transform uh, into the most modern ones, most the greenest ones. Uh, and this is also um, like you know the signal of the needs of the markets that we are that we are seeing and we want to remain very active in this area definitely. Okay, good. Um, quick questions coming from Ben Esmail as well, which is, um, I I'm curious if Luke, so this is, I guess, coming to you, Luke, <laughs> uh, could paint the big picture of shared service centres in Poland particularly. Is it a demand growth picture? I, I wish I could paint the picture fully, but I think we're still in the wait and see phase right now. Uh, the early indications are that it is going to continue to grow. I think the growth has obviously been tempered over the past year um, just with everything that's happened. But we do see that demand is starting to come back. Um, and, and I think that you'll see certain tenants perhaps downsize just because their business has shifted, uh, particularly if you're looking on the travel side, anything related to hospitality, a lot of those shared service centers, we expect them, frankly, to give back space, even if it's just short term and then take it back up in a year. Um, but we, we, we've seen, I think, enough indications on the positive side uh, that we think overall we're expecting, I think it's around 6% growth for this year. Uh, on the BPO shared service side in terms of the total the total number of, of people employed in that industry. Um, and while that's behind historical averages, it's still very positive in light of, of what's happened. Um, so we're, we're positive overall. We think it's going to continue to drive the secondary city markets across Poland. Um, and, and we think that it's going to be one of the largest sectors, frankly, across Central Europe in terms of the occupier side. OK, um, I, I, I'd like to pick up just that secondary cities part as well. Um, John, I know you've been active in Gdansk lately, also with the Olivia Business Centre. I think they're doing doing deals in that region anyway. But how do you see that the, the secondary cities? Do you think that's going to benefit in a way from this or do you think it's kind of um, I mean, from from the health crisis? I mean, the UK, there's been a lot of talk about secondary cities benefiting from it. Um, as mm -hmm. businesses believe that they can move further out. Um, what's your sense of that, particularly looking at the Polish market? The, the secondary cities, or, or sort of, let's call them the major cities, will all, all benefit from, from a sort of resurgence in um, people being able to have a bit more flexibility in terms of where they might work from. Uh, but then the, those cities themselves will become sort of hubs that will attract people to, to, to work in uh, from, from the regions rather than um, sort of being sort of... Sort of um, Competing sort of capitals, if you if you want for want for a better word, um, 
I, yeah, I mean, it's, for me, it's, it is though too early to tell. I think it depends a lot on government policy um, in, in anywhere, whereby um, if, if cities are going to grow, a lot of that depends on how the government wants to incentivize people to to invest in those cities, um, whether it's through regeneration or, or, or other initiatives. Um, uh, but I, I, I I don't sense. I mean, compared to something like the UK, where where it's very, very London centric, um, and and to the point where I would say that you know I think nine out of the ten sort of most deprived areas in Northern Europe are in the UK, um, in, in in northern northern cities. I think Poland doesn't have that problem. Um, it's a well connected, it's a well connected country. Um, it has uh, sort of a, a good diverse uh, range of, of of businesses in most cities. The logistics. Um, reflects that. Um, I mean, take Gdansk particularly. We're interested in, interested in Gdansk. We have a student housing um, facility there. We've invested in some PRS there. We've uh, built some logistics there. Um, it's a nice place to live. I mean, well, it would be a nice place to live if I was able to get there. Um, I, hard for me to comment with any authority, though, on, it, on the comment uh, generally. Sorry. OK, no, that's great. Um, so three questions I just want to tackle and whoever wishes to can. Uh, thanks, Irving, for this. Is there any view on the Slovakia real estate market? Um, Zuzana, um, which is logistics sector, yields have been rather stable over the last few quarters. Where do you see the compression coming from mainly, i.e. increasing construction costs, availability of land, occupational market? Um, and then one final one, which is how quickly is the speculative office development pipeline slowing in Poland um, following several years of significant expansion? Um, so it, does anybody want to pick up any of those? I mean, I'll, I'll have to be jumping on the logistics sector. I mean, compression, I think, is going to come from 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 in the investment side. I mean, I think that the the occupational market will stay strong. I, I think, if anything, sort of the, the the lack of container capacity in the last three or four months into Europe, as well as sort of just in time weaknesses in the system over the last year, will I think sort of start to, to sort of bolster occupied demand. But but Poland has a lot of land, um, and um, and that land will will continue to be. Sort of converted into into logistics use, but investors wanting quality, I think, will be the the key driver of yield compression. If indeed there is there is much yield compression, I mean, I think the the, the medium term prospects for for inflation, you know, who, no one wants to talk about it, but they are they may come there through the sort of fiscal stimulus, um, and its effect on both bond markets and and debt servicing might sort of temper appetites for much yield compression. But let's see. OK, good. Does anybody want to pick up Slovakia? And also thank you, Tanya, for sneaking in right at the end there, which is any comments on Bulgaria? Anybody want Bulgaria? Anybody want Slovakia? Um, I can pick up Slovakia, although Perfect. we don't really invest there. Uh, but, you know, obviously, obviously we keep monitoring it. I mean, like Slovakian market is is quite small. And from for many institutional players, it, it's just it's just too small. And as a result of that, they, they don't really have Slovakia on their investment map. At the same time, uh, and particularly with, when it comes to logistics, I think that logistics does not really recognize the border. So if you have, uh, if you have a major, you know, C pen, like uh, C a, a fund uh, looking at the logistics, you don't really uh, distinguish between Czech and, and Slovakian logistic uh, project. And, and as a result of that, we would be able to invest in Slovakian logistics without any problem. And, and, and to, to, to the question on the, you know, where, the, where the pricing will be driven, uh, it clearly comes from two factors. First of all, uh, you know, occupational market um, in Central Europe will be, I think, super strong. There is a there is a global trend that that uh, we still have uh, you know sufficient uh, labor force which is uh, traditionally much cheaper relative to the Western uh, markets and uh, and we can see uh, especially in Poland there is uh, significant growth and and those manufacturers and and you know when you look at big guys like Amazon or, or Zalando or some other uh, big players. They, they, they really penetrate into those markets very strongly, and yet they don't really operate in, in Central Europe. So, so there is a next wave of, of further exposure that will actually accelerate, accelerate uh, the demand. And, and without, without a major doubt, uh, we're going to see a, a yield compression in those segments because still they're yielding 
uh, with, I don't know, almost like 150 to 200 basis points premium, which is, I think, not really justifiable. And I think that a lot of investors uh, sees that as, as a great, as a great um, uh, premium. And as a result of that, we will see more and more money coming uh, and hitting that segment. I, I, Thomas, I'd, I'd agree broadly. My one comment is that I think what I notice, and particularly in CE, is the spread between sort of the very best covenant and and sort of the more sort of every everyday business is quite high. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. that I mean perhaps that may spread. I mean, we, there, there was a graph earlier of six percent as being the sort of the prime yield in Poland. I think that's yeah. probably I think it's better than that, um, and I think it's much better than that if you talk about an Amazon. But um, uh, it'll be interesting to see where that spread goes. I think. It, it, because you can still get some very tight yields in Poland uh, or, or CEE, um, but also you can get some very high yields. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think that 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 uh, that gap between the best of the assets and and secondary is is still uh, is still very huge. Um, good. Um, Luke, just quickly, any any comments on Bulgaria? Yeah, I think from an uh, institutional investment standpoint, Bulgaria is still going to frankly struggle for a while. Um, I think just it, it's always had a problem attracting larger investments. The ticket sizes are smaller. There's worries about liquidity. And that's frankly going to continue at least for the next, I would say, 12 months until the markets really find their footing. Uh, having looking past that, you could argue that you could see some people step in there on the more opportunistic side, just frankly, from a cash on cash return perspective, yields are still very much at the top end of the table across Central Europe. Um, so and there's some development opportunity just given the, the lack of development, particularly on the industrial side that I think uh, it will be it will be next the next frontier for a lot of developers because they've already done Serbia. Romania is almost getting to the point of being built out. So I think you'll see Bulgaria maybe be the next target for logistics industrial. OK, great. Um, and Alex, thanks very much for, for your comment. Um, uh, Alex is just saying that he's noticed from from obviously where he is uh, in Italy, um, particularly investors being interested in build to rent, logistics, senior living and hospitality portfolios. Um, and the hospitality portfolios is, is assuming um, opportunities with the distressed assets. Um, if anybody has a comment on that, now is the time to make it. Um, and, and I'm not sure if we picked up the speculative office development pipeline. I don't know if anybody wants to say anything just about the development markets. Well, for sure, in the in the short or medium term, I think that the current situ situation will result in a certain limitation of the of the of the spec product, let's say. And of course, uh, the banks will have their role in this. I I mean, currently, of course, um, in the in the with the uncertainty in the market and so on, the the banks will not be willing to land on uh, spec development projects. This is this is what we are hearing, what we are seeing. But on the other hand side, I think also the developers themselves, um, well, they they are acting in a reasonable way and, and they will want to, they already are um, uh, amending and modifying their development pipelines just, 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 just um, to, uh, to reflect the, well, uh, the current crisis. I don't want to say the crisis, but the current market situation. They want to concentrate, first of all, on the full lease up of the year, uh, already existing completed, completed buildings to have them uh, then placed as investment products. And I think this will be the moment when they will uh, start again to think of new developments. Um, and well, I also think that we will not get rid of, of, uh, of the speculative uh, um, element in the office development um, at all, because this is one of the specifics I would, I would, um, I would guess of the, of the Polish market. The, the only thing I'd add is I think pre-leases are going to become or already are, but will continue to be difficult um, because I just think corporates aren't willing to sign for a lease in two years. Mm -hmm. it, 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 they're barely willing to sign right now for something that's that's available. Um, yeah. Everything's in flux. So I think that's what's going to slow down the stock market for the next while. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a fascinating story that, that, that might evolve as a result of the past year, whereby occupiers might decide to start taking shorter and shorter leases or more and more flexibility as part of their lease, this sort of you know, portfolio for, for, the, for the companies in order to adopt a more flexible working standards across the business. Last, last question here. Um, so we have, um, we have uh, Gary um, asking whether or not um, there's a, uh, when do we expect to see a full recovery? Um, in the in the CE markets, 
Um, so I guess let's 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 tackle that one. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be this year. I, I believe that if we're going to see if you're comparing it to 2019 is the benchmark and you're asking, when are we going to get back to that kind of activity levels? Uh, I think optimistically, you're really looking at 2022. Um, but it's, it's just so hard to say, because even if we get volumes at the same level, the makeup of that volume is going to be very different. Um, so it's, it's not going to be this year. OK, super. Justina, what's what's your view on that? I think again that it might not be enough uh, just just for us uh, to go through uh, this year months. Well, probably we will we will um, need to wait a, a bit longer. But I think that what's 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 most important for us is the uh, is the um, is that all mar market players seem to seem to be convinced that the uh, that the outlook still remains positive and once the uh, pandemic is uh, is is not there any longer or has been uh, has been limited uh, due to the vaccinations or thanks to the vaccinations and so on then the activity will be there again at a full pace okay perfect and uh, last one because i'd like to finish on an opportunity point which is where do we see the 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 biggest opportunity for, for CE markets in 2021. Um, Luke, where, where do you see them? Well, I mean, if, if you were looking to be more opportunistic and take more risk, um, I think you could focus on, on retail. Um, and I don't mean necessarily shopping centers, but I think that uh, if you're looking at kind of conversions, uh, there, there's going to be some opportunity there where it's older stock and you can repurpose it potentially for uh, whether it's residential or whether it's urban logistics, things like that. I think uh, there will be some some room there in that space. OK, super. Justina. From a lender's perspective, I think that the bank will more, cor more, will more concentrate not on the opportunities, but rather on the challenges and, you know, trying to make sure that the and that the challenges will, will be uh, addressed in an adequate way. On the other hand, while, well, you know, opportunity, uh, well, uh, we are saying that uh, good loans are given or granted in bad times. So maybe this, this might be this, 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 this time for us now. Thanks very much for joining us um, and uh, look forward to the next one. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.